My name is Astrid van der Velde, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of NWE Chance. I chair this meeting together with Hans-Peter Brune La Rocca from Maastricht University Medical Center, and he is associated with Passion HF. Uh, just a small setting the scene for NWE Chance. Within NWE Chance, we develop and validate promising integrated e-health applications for hospitalization of heart failure patients at home. And our main objectives are to develop an integrated prototype home hospitalization platform, and we evaluate the feasibility of the home hospitalization platform with the supporting care process. And we also will establish a sustainable innovation hub. And our project has received funding from the Interreg Northwest Europe program on the grant agreement number NWE661. Uh, and I'm associated with Isela, the lead partner of NWE Chance, but I'm here together with all other partners, Sananet, HG at Home, Sensium, those are companies or SMEs, uh, with the hospitals Maastricht University Medical Center and Yessa Hospital, and furthermore, the University of Hasselt, the Digital Health and Care Innovation Center, the European Health and Telematics Association, and Built in Europe. Now, I would like to give the word to Hans-Peter Brune La Rocca. Good morning, uh, everybody. I would like to welcome you on behalf of, um, well, Passion HF. Uh, we are as well supported by Interreg. Well, the number is 702 instead of uh, 661, but uh, that was also the support. And that is also the reason to actually have a joint session. And also because we are both or both projects are about heart failure and treating at home. So that was also the reason why initially uh, Interreg asked us also to see whether we can find uh, common ground, common interests. And of course, we were participating in uh, NWE uh, chance. And uh, well, you are associate partner also in our project and you will see that heart failure is a common problem. I will go into detail about that. And it's also a treatment where we really need paradigm shifts, actually how to address and treat these patients. And that's why actually we joined the efforts here also to have this common symposium. So very welcome to uh, all of you. So I would like actually to give an introduction to you what is heart failure. And I will start with a very short case presentation. It's not so much about the medical content, of course, I will present some medical details, but just to show you the complexity of treating this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, patients. The second part is also to explain to you what makes heart failure one of the most complex chronic diseases. And this is important to understand because if we don't understand, it's also very difficult actually to find solutions um, how to better treat these patients. And there is a threat or there are threats to the current way how we treat um, heart failure. Also coming back to that, um, just uh, providing also new approaches that are required and obviously then also the connection between NWE Chance and Passion HF before we go into details of these projects. I would like to start as I said with a case presentation of a 68-year-old man that has, uh, well, cardiovascular risk factors. And actually, he had two weeks before he presented in the hospital, uh, well, about 10 minutes at rest of chest pain with radiation to left shoulders, uh, to the left arm, to the back. Uh, he also had some sweating, uh, he's perspired, um, no nausea, no syncope. The symptoms disappeared while at rest uh, or without doing much. After that, he had repeated episodes when he was doing some minor exercise of similar uh, chest pain. He was also a little bit short of breath, 
This actually um, lasted a little bit longer. And the GP sent him to an exercise test. And when um, an ECG was made, then we saw that this patient obviously had a myocardial infarction. He has quite some risk factors, including hypertension and diabetes. Here we already see one of the problems. Many of these patients have additional diseases. He was admitted to hospital for an angiography. One of the main arteries was occluded. It was reopened. You can discuss about the well, usefulness of this, but this is not the topic. He was treated with diuretics because after um, starting a beta blocker and this angiography, he decompensated, so he was volume overloaded and also showed some temporary worsening of renal failure. We see another chronic disease actually coming up. Uh, he had an admission of about seven days to get rid of uh, this fluid. He was discharged with quite some medication. So um, it's actually three, four or four for heart failure and three to four other uh, drugs. He was seen in the outpatient clinic two weeks later, actually to establish the common therapy for heart failure. Um, so in fact, to achieve that, he had three outpatient visits and three phone calls. Uh, he also received, because of the poor ejection fraction, uh, implantable defibrillator three months later, and he was readmitted to hospital due to decompensation five months later. So we have a patient here that actually had within six months three hospitalizations, total 16 days, of which he was two days on the uh, CCU. Um, he also had seven outpatient contacts. He had one control of his device and two additional contacts with the GP. So you can really see how labor intensive and also resource intensive this patient is. And this is not a, well, exception, what I'm presenting here. This is common practice. So the problem is what could have been done in this patient remotely at home and by what means and also what could be done by the patient himself now and also in the future. Because if we're talking about this, we're talking about a paradigm shift that could help actually to sustain or to maintain the quality of care, what we have. Because with heart failure, but also with many other chronic diseases, we see a kind of circle. From a newly diagnosed patients, often they are first actually investigated and diagnosed, um, well, in the outpatient setting, some as in this patient, this was primarily in an inpatient setting. Many of these patients present with deterioration, are admitted to hospital, uh, and then they go back into this cycle. Um, I think it's needless to say, the more severe the disease is, well, the faster this cycle actually turns, and the more likely it is actually this patient get admitted. And that this is very resource intense, I think, is, uh, is self-explanatory. There are, however, various aspects that make heart failure very complex, in addition to this, what actually applies to basically all chronic diseases. And the question is, what is it? One is heart failure, as most chronic diseases, is a disease of the very old. And you may have seen a figure like this uh, previously, where you see that depending on age, most chronic diseases actually increase in prevalence. However, if you look at heart diseases in general, this increase is much steeper than for most other chronic diseases. And this has an impact. And of course, heart failure is part of that. And at present, it's estimated in Western countries that about 2% of the total population actually has heart failure. If we're looking at the more elderly ones above 75 years of age, it's more than 10%. If we're going above 80, 85, it's one in six. 
and it expected actually that this further increases. The estimation are that in Europe, in the EU, we'll have about 20 million patients with heart failure by 2025. So it's really an endemic and we have to do something about it. And as presented with this case, this is common and these are data from the UK, but they are applicable also to other countries. And you see that also the comorbidities actually increased significantly over time. Right now you can say that half of the patients have at least six additional chronic diseases when they have heart failure. And some of them are also cardiovascular, but some of them are also not related to cardiovascular diseases. And I'm coming back to that because this has not only implications to, because it makes it more complex, but also that it makes diagnosis often not that easy. I don't want to go into too many details. I just would like to show you with this, and I can see that while the blue colors here on the left-hand side cannot be seen on this uh, uh, slide or with the projection, but most of these diseases have some kind of interaction regarding risk factor, but also symptoms over diagnostic workup. So they make the situation more complex, but they also have some threats and cautions and contraindications regarding the treatment. And they also have some, well, interaction. They also have some synergies so that you treat, for instance, hypertension. Um, these drugs are also being used for treating heart failure, but it just illustrates how complex it gets when we're talking about a treatment of heart failure with many comorbidities. In addition, treatment is not easy because of this, and it's also not uniformly applied. And we have looked at it in the Netherlands, and what you can see here is out of 34 Dutch centers, how often patients with heart failure, in this case with reduced ejection fraction, as in our patient, are actually treated with particular drugs that are used in heart failure. And you can see that there is quite some difference between the different centers. And actually what they should receive, now it's actually four different drugs, but um, at that time it was three, that in one center it was as little as about 15% of the patients really receiving that, and in another one it was 75%. This is not explainable by differences in patients only to a minor extent. So obviously the way how we doctors and nurses interpret heart failure varies also quite significantly and this obviously has a significant impact. The question is does it matter and yes it does because this is more a theoretical calculation but I find this very useful because it actually shows compared to conventional therapy of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in red and the currently recommended therapy, that there is a huge difference of life expectancy. Uh, when you look at the panel D on the um, right-hand uh, side, you actually see the difference in life expectancy. So at younger age, it's as much as six years. When we're talking about cancer treatment, we find it great if we extend life by four to six months. Here we're talking about six years. And it's not that the red ones are not treated with any drugs at all. They already receive heart failure treatment. And even at an age sorry, of 80, it's still about two years. And if we're talking about event-free survival without hospitalization, the difference is even larger. So it really has an impact. But when we look at reality, then there is a dependency on age. So all the people's, other people or patients with heart failure are less well treated as compared to the younger ones. You could say, well, does it matter? Because maybe all the people don't want to have longevity, but more quality of life. We actually asked it. And in a group 
average of 76 years, three quarter of the patients said they would not give one single day of their life to have a perfect quality of life. So also in these patients, it actually matters and you have to ask them what they think about it and not just assume. But obviously, we're not doing it the right way. Also, assessment is difficult. And this has to some extent or is some extent related to the comorbidities. And we have looked at this in our outpatient clinic and found that on the left hand side, that patients with COPD, as compared with those without, have more symptoms. Heart failure was the same in the two groups. So obviously there is an overlap regarding symptoms. And it also affects on the right hand side also the quality of life of these patients. But this means it's not that easy to really say, well, is it now heart failure? Is it cellopathy? Is it something else? So that makes it challenging. And from another study, we looked at, well, how often patients, even in the course of a study in this case, actually remained congested. And it was a significant proportion. Of course, it got less initially, but still, longer term, quite some patients remained congested. And this is related, I deleted this slide, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is related also to poor outcome. So it really matters that we look at this very carefully. But it's not easy and it's challenging in clinical practice. Another problem is that evidence is limited to a relatively small proportion of the entire heart failure population. And you can estimate that this about 20 to 25 percent. Because in the studies, often patients with comorbidities were not included. And there is quite some debate also in the medical community um, whether just guidelines should be implemented in all patients with heart failure or also in some. And actually whether this is the best way to do, we simply don't really know. Um, of course, on one hand, there are reasons for implementation and this is, there is no clear evidence that some patients may not profit. Um, there is also heart failure therapy improves aspects beyond survival, including quality of life. So even if this is not a top priority, we discuss this. Um, also, they improve quality of life. This is important. And also the analysis of registries of course, this is not really directly comparable with an RCT, so with a randomized controlled trial, suggests positive effects also in those patients that were not really included in the RCTs. But on the other hand, um, particularly in primary care, we don't really know because these patients were not included in the studies. Um, also, the very old one and those with many comorbidities were often ex excluded. We don't exactly know how important the interactions are. That's not really well established. It obviously was a pre-selection of patients. And when we look at real world data, adverse events are much more than in RCTs. So this is a kind of debate. And what we actually would need is a more personalized approach. And I think both projects actually try to address this, to really um, look at the individual patient and to treat them accordingly. Another problem is that in acute heart failure, so if somebody we name that decompensate, so they are fluid overloaded and need to be treated, we actually don't really know what we should be doing because all studies really all studies have been negative. This is just a relatively recent example. You see two lines overlapping. That means whether you do the intervention or not, it doesn't really matter that much. But this results in actually some, well, recommendations. And the important part is, and that's why I'm mentioning it here, that quite some of the recommendations actually could also be applied at home. And I think this is an important part because here it said non-invasive monitoring of different kind of things are important for this kind of treatment of patients 
even though it's only, well, uh, often it's called uh, eminence-based instead of evidence-based. Um, and it's still the same as we do it 30 years ago, so with treating diuretics. But there are some recommendations in that uh, regard, but it doesn't really require to admit the patients to the hospital. It could be done also at home. And one of the main problems is that the high quality uh, care of heart failure is not really sustainable, is threatened. And this is not because heart failure, or not only because heart failure is an endemic, but it's also because costs are rapidly increasing. So the resources are short, and we also have less healthcare professionals. Um, it's already now a problem in developing countries, but also already in remote areas in Europe. And actually, it's not sustainable without reduction of quality of care if we maintain things the way how we do it right now. This is an example from the larger region of Amsterdam. Just to give you an impression, uh, inhabitants in the whole Netherlands are expected by 23 to increase by about 5%. If we're talking about 80 years old, it's 61%. So this will really be a shift towards the very elderly. Uh, you see here in some areas it's even more. And importantly, already right now, there is a significant shortage of healthcare professionals. And Many of them are nurses, but not only. There are also GPs. Um, so um, in the Netherlands, it's becoming more and more difficult actually to find a GP if you move to a different area. And this will only increase. And this is also recognized by WHO for the European regions that there are imbalances and shortages um, and this is of major concern. There was some increase, about 10% in the past 10 years, but the uh, WHO says it's unlikely that this increase will be stable and sufficient to cover the needs. There is also a significant inequality uh, in available physicians, and even more so of nurses, between countries and it's particularly that there are not sufficient GPs and there is an imbalance between specialists and GPs, um, basically in most countries. Another problem is that one third of the physicians, as me, are older than 55 years. So they will stop in the next years, 10 years or so. And there is also a shift to more women as physician. And this is uh, certainly not that the quality by this actually is different, not at all. But on average, they work less hours than men. And this is still a reality in Europe. So we will really face a problem. And how can we solve this problem? And of course, we already have some things that are going on. Uh, for instance, a shift to primary care. But we heard, well, we don't have sufficient GPs, so this will not be the problem. Concentration of care and also uniforming care that, my, of that might, um, well, reduce it a little bit. But I don't think that this is really the solution or really has a major impact on the problem. Prevention of chronic diseases is an important one. However, prevention actually just, well, shift the development to a later age. I mean, it's, this is fine that we get chronic diseases at a later stage in life, but we'll still get it. And I think nobody of us really wants not to be treated to say, for instance, if you're 80, we stop treatment. Um, so um, unless you can pay it by yourself, I think that's not a really solution. And we really have new visions of care uh, that are required. And the question is, how? And, well, we think that the involvement of the healthcare provider that is most motivated is crucial in that. And who's that? The patient. 
And that's actually to bring remote care monitoring to the patient at home, to have early targeted interventions, as mentioned, care as close to the patient as possible. And finally, to achieve also some self treatment actually could be a solution. Of course, this requires a certain shift and also some consequences. The patients need to take some responsibility. They also need to better understand, better monitor. Um, they need more controls, but by themselves, less by healthcare professional. It needs some time. That's on one hand, but also regarding the healthcare professionals, they need to learn to let go. And that's not always easy. Um, needs to support of discharge to primary care and from primary care actually to patient at home. Uh, less controls, maybe if any, in stable patients, reduction in concentration, but the focus on the really complex situations. And acceptance remains a problem. I think this is recognizable by all of you. What we want to achieve is actually shift from these intervals with hospital visits or private care visits <coughs> and, uh, well, with long waiting lists, uh, incomplete implementation of guidelines to more a continuum that is to a significant extent done by the patient. And this may also include the hospitalizations or the care at home in patients that are decompensated. This means that not all deterioration, or need, this not means, but it means that not all deterioration can be prevented, but it is possible actually to also do some treatment at home. And we will hear how NWE Chance is actually doing that um, to actually provide care close to the, uh, to the patient at home, even if they deteriorate. So what are the added values of the two projects, just to complete my talk? And of course, both address heart failure. And they are complementary, because they focus on care at home, both in and outpatient. I think that's the really nice thing. They support self-care as long as it is possible, but they support the patient at home if it is required. To increase both quality of care, but also efficiency of care, and also quality of life for the patients that actually can be improved. I would like also to uh, have with us uh, Dr. Busnatu, who is online in Bucharest. With, with Dr. Busnatu, we have uh, uh, someone who is working on a third project, on another project, also uh, at home, uh, also for caring patients at home, but in this context on rehabilitation. So uh, Dr. Busnatu is also a cardiologist and uh, uh, is, uh, is therefore participating to uh, or implementing with some colleagues uh, a project to enable people, uh, patients who had a, a heart failure to uh, be cared and rehabilitated to be followed up at home in a more active way and as it is today. So that's also the important point of uh, having uh, this, this additional example uh, in, the, uh, in, in this conversation. So are you observing that uh, because of the pandemic, there's really an acceleration in, uh, uh, in, in, in combining or in combining digital and virtual world uh, and a uh, face-to-face -face world and in, uh, in also accelerating the transfer of the place of care from the hospital to home. Is this something that you are today observing in real life, apart from projects which are preparing this movement? Are you already observing that? Ladies first? Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thanks for the question, Mark. Yes, indeed. Uh, at Isla, we are observing that the COVID pandemic has been an accelerator for transferring care to the home setting or to provide care in a hybrid model. Because the hospitals, and not only uh, the Isla hospital, but also other hospitals, were searching for ways to provide patients care that could not come to the hospital. So that could either be telemonitoring, 
uh, that could either be um, uh, just treatment at home. Um, so yes, I definitely think that the COVID pandemic has been an accelerator to the transfer of hospital care to the home setting. Thank you, Astrid. Stefan, your views from Bucharest? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Astrid, for the comments. Uh, now I'm giving a, a point of view because, as you said, we are working together with, within the university in VCARE, which is a telerehabilitation uh, project that covers also cardiac use cases in ischemic heart disease and heart failure, which we are. Oops. Communication issue. Hold on. Ah. Sometimes the internet. Do you hear is... me? Yeah. Uh, well, we you, you have been interrupted, so uh, please restart. Uh, I I I switched off. I switched off the video, hoping okay. that uh, I'll hear better. Mm -hmm. I was saying that I'll speak um, uh, from the ministerial point of view because uh, I'm also counselor for of our Minister of Health in terms of digitalization. And I think it's quite important to view this, uh, this matter from the public and from the private sector. Because in Romania, we have a public sector that hasn't been developed in terms of infrastructure to support telerehabilitation. We supported in the most severe period of pandemia the use of uh, telemedicine, but using non-conventional methods. Uh, but on the other side, if we speak about private sector, the private sector has endorsed the telemedicine, as also as Astrid presented, using conventional tools, standardized tools that uh, ensured uh, secured communications, patient monitoring, and they have a lot of data with whom we started working now and try to build things also for the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Peter. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I agree with uh, what uh, has been said and we see this uh, well increase and this uh, boost as well. On the one hand, what we intensified were well phone contacts with, uh, with patients. We did that Hi. already before. Of course, this is also kind of remote care mm -hmm. um, and that patients only went to the hospital as to have blood taken and that then uh, the rest or uh, having done an ECG, but the rest is done uh, remotely. However, I think the big challenge is to really integrate um, also all the kind of devices that we have and to use them in the most efficient way. And the big challenge is to really um, make this part um, of the standard of care. So that often what we see is that telemedicine and remote monitoring is used on top of standard of care and that the standard of care doesn't really change much. And in this way, we are obviously not really achieving what we want. The treatment of, well, remotely, um, that the patients have less contact, but also we don't uh, achieve, uh, well, a more efficient way of uh, treating patients, uh, in, well, in this case, mm -hmm. uh, with heart failure. And I think this is something we need to learn, how we actually can um, accommodate this as part of usual care, mm -hmm. instead of just um, having kind of two separate words. And uh, this is uh, certainly a challenge that we see mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Am I then right to, um, to see that to, to say that uh, here we are just at the level of uh, in a maturity process on how to use and how to integrate dig digital care into the normal healthcare system? We have done that to, because of, the, 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 of the, the pandemic. This happened in urgency, trying to face all the problems uh, as we could in an ad hoc way. But now the, the time is really start to start to polish, to start to, en to, to really ensure the integration. That's, yeah. that's the message. I, uh, oh. I fully agree. Mm -hmm. And of course, also to educate patients, to give them also confidence. Because what I often hear from patients is, I want to see you. I just feel more mm -hmm. safe. Um, and of course, I mean, this is not really the idea. I try to explain to patients, well, it's that I'm there um, if you really need me. Mm -hmm. But that means that just to have a conversation with you and everything is going fine is not really the efficient way. And um, patients still have problems to adapt that, but doctors and nurses likewise. 
because to really um, be convinced that a kind of monitoring that is done remotely actually has the same value as if they see it by themselves. Uh, this is still something we need to learn. Okay, so here you are just launching the ball for the, my next question. Where are the pain points? Where are the difficulties in this combination, on this hybridation of the models of care? We, you, we, we just evoked the idea of, uh, 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 of integrating and adapting the organization in order to be able to reduce the usual way of delivering care and combine it with, uh, 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 with the digital way to, for delivering care. That's, that's one. You have now evoked the patient, which are the most motivated healthcare provider. I will remember that. Mm -hmm. But so, are they a, a, pinpoint, a, a pain point? In a way, they still need to learn, they still need to understand, as, you, as I understood. And on the, healthcare, the, on the healthcare provider side, on the professional one, let's say, you have the same issue. So that's, with here we have integration, we have uh, 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 education on the, on, the, on, the, on the patients, and we have also training, uh, uh, acceptance by health professionals. That's the three pain points that we still have to, and on the, on, on, on the Zwolle side. Well, actually, I can relate to what is already said by Hans Peter. You see that both the patient needs to learn, the healthcare professional needs to learn. We need to have an integrated uh, approach. But what also might be a challenge is that to uh, make this integrated approach a sustainable approach. Because now we had an accelerator um, and we are providing all kinds of care at home. But it's, of course, the question whether this is a sustainable uh, ID. For instance, in the Netherlands now, we have reimbursement for all kinds of um, hospital care at home. In other countries, uh, this is not part of um, the reimbursement system. Uh, but now with COVID, there are more possibilities. It's the question, what will happen uh, when the, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, uh, diminishes? <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> and I just can Peter, add something to that. I think that's a really important point. That's also what we see a little bit in our outpatient clinic because so slowly, slowly, we're actually getting back to the old way how we have treated patients. And this is really related because, um, well, it was a kind of urgency. We did that, but we didn't think sufficiently about, well, what does this really now mean um, to have an integrated approach um, in the way how we address our patients. And that's, uh, I think, a crucial one also to make it sustainable. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stefan, how you do know, you see that uh, the, I, the pain I, point or difficulties? And we are very happy now that uh, everyone in the audience <laughs> is seeing you. That's fantastic. That's beautiful technology. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Stefan, how do you see from uh, wh where do you see the pain points, the, the the real difficulties that you are facing here in, in in Bucharest with this combination of this hybridation of the model of care? You know, uh, when we speak about sustainability, I I think that uh, we gained some insights from uh, our VCare project because. Uh, we used to do traditional cardiac rehabilitation, ambulatory rehabilitation for heart failure patients in uh, in the hospital, and uh, somehow by you know, the patients seeing their results, they were more committed into continuing and use the technology at home in order to maintain that results and maybe to improve them. And I think that this step of building the trust of the patient it's very important into ensuring continuity of care and somehow we need to have a hybrid model in order to give the treatment to the patient to make them trust us trust the technology trust the results of the service that we provide and on the other side we need to continue the management of the patient using the technology because uh, we will involve him in this uh, cycle that will be a lifelong cycle somehow into the management of a heart failure patient especially. Yeah, that's what we have understood indeed from the description of the disease uh, of, this, of this morning. Thank you, Stefan. In the audience, any, um, any, any contribution or any, any comments on uh, this uh, movement and this acceleration process that took place? as well as on the difficulties to maintain, to make it sustainable? Yeah, 
th thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I suppose one of the questions I have is we talk a lot about pain. Um, what about the benefits that you've seen from actually providing the service um, to the patients? I mean, obviously, we need the pain points to make sure the service is sustainable. But what's the benefits to patients? What's the pe benefits to clinicians? Well, I think that's, uh, that's a good point, because if um, nobody has a benefit, <laughs> obviously nobody will do it. And uh, this is also a question often posed by, by patients. But on the one hand, we also hear uh, from patients that use remote monitoring that they feel safe. Because it's not just that they go to, well, a cardiologist, uh, for instance, uh, every three or six months, but they also have some monitoring in between. I think this is uh, an important point that must not be underestimated. And in case of need, <coughs> they have somebody to ask, even if it's a robot, but uh, to see, am I really safe? Uh, do I have to do something? Of course, not all patients can do that, but I think that's uh, an important benefit. Patients need to be aware of this. Um, in addition, when we look at the further developments, on the other hand, um, the question is not so much um, what an individual patient or healthcare provider actually wants, because it's more the question what um, can be done. And if we have waiting lists of six months uh, to see a patient, even if it's urgent, then I think we are not really going in the right direction. And then the question is, what can we do? Uh, actually to, to be accessible uh, if it's needed, but to let it go um, if it's possible. And of course, we need to learn that. But if people start to understand that this is the only way, I'm convinced, that um, this makes healthcare sustainable um, at a good quality, um, then I think, uh, well, the motivation is almost self-explanatory. Yeah, and in addition, um, of course, we need to provide value-based health care uh, for the society in general. But also, when having a look at the patients who are admitted at home, is what we see is that those patients uh, are very satisfied because they are often elderly patients. Um, so if you admit them at home, they stay in their own environment. Uh, with their own loved ones, with, for instance, their partner or with their sons or daughters. Um, and they, what you also see is that those patients uh, are more active because when you are admitted in a hospital, you lay flat in your hospital bed and you wait for the doctor or nurse to come. But when you are at home, uh, the patients are really happy to open the door for the nurse who visit them. Uh, so it also stimulates a more active way of living, even if they are admitted at home. Um, even even the opening the door to the grandchildren. Yes, yes. Even, and even going to a walk with the with the dog or taking care of the cat. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then, Stefan, any comments <laughs> on uh, on this on these benefits? I would also support that using technology is the the best tool for empowering patients, heart failure patients, because somehow uh, we also have this issue when we speak especially for physical activity. We have a big problem with our patients in the rehabilitation sessions when they need to come to the planned schedule in the hospital and doing physical activity. On the other side, when we deploy the system at their home, the serious game system, and they are able to perform the physical activities whenever they like during the specified day, we have better results in terms of their enjoyability, I would say, and, say, and adherence to doing physical activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Any last question? Time flies. Good morning. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit late, but uh, even in 2007 already I was starting uh, one of the first European uh, telemonitoring projects by myself and some other uh, guys. And even at that moment, the outcome, the study of the outcome was extremely positive. 
So then it uh, disappeared a little bit. Uh, and just like you said, with COVID, it pops up. And now everyone was convinced that it, that's the way to do it. Uh, so uh, indeed, I think we, we need to grab the momentum to keep it under the attention. Otherwise, it will dimister away again just like it was after 2007. Uh. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Well, well, while we are all f wondering ourselves what will happen next and, and how will we live differently after this pandemic. So we are all, nobody today has the answer, but that's clearly the, uh, uh, an well, important point. Thank I, you. Uh, I fully agree and I think that's uh, an important point to really make this happen. Um, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's, it's really important to think about how can remote care be part of standard of care, because only then it will be used and otherwise it will disappear again. Indeed. Good. Thank you. A very last question. Janet, Ari, go ahead. Allowed another. Um, so I suppose, <coughs> and, and going back to the last question, actually, the evidence you know, is the evidence not there? Is it not compelling enough? You know, why is it? Why are these projects not scaling? I suppose is my question. <laughs> that's that's. If I, may, uh, I think it's 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 a good, but also well, if somebody says this is a good question, uh, um, it means I don't know the exact answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, an important part is that um, it's not comparable to prescribing a new pill because this is really uh, black and white it's 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 fairly easy and when we're talking about uh, well telemonitoring or remote care then it's um, all different kind of interventions uh, each center does and this varies quite significantly i think that's one explanation the second one is that most of the studies actually were quite small um, so didn't really have the power to be um, convincing. Um, I mean, if we look at uh, meta-analysis, they are actually quite convincing, but because it's then not really defined what really makes the difference. Um, is it the monitoring? Is it, uh, well, the phone calls or, or what is it exactly? Um, then it really makes it uh, difficult. And then lastly, you also need then to translate that into your own healthcare system uh, and the way how you approach patients. And I think these points together make it so challenging actually to uh, adopt that. And there is another slide that I remember from your side uh, with this comparison of this, this analysis of the pro and the contra of the uh, implementation guidelines for heart failure, where you has, there is a discussion about the value of the RCT in real life. And that's really, so, that's really an example where we have evidence, but evidence is not enough. Adoption and integrate and, and adoption in the sense of accepting, but in the sense also of adapting and integrating the, the way to deliver care. Good. Thanks a lot for this. If I can make a short comment, I would say that we have a, a randomized control trial done by Professor Köhler in Charité in almost uh, 1,500 patients. So we have some data, but we don't have enough data. This is the question. The, uh, the response. Okay. Yeah, data, 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 data. We we are just <laughs> we are just at the beginning of collecting data. A last word. But a uh, last word. I also think it's not only the data. It's also that change is difficult and it it causes resistance. So that's also something you need to keep in mind. Thank you.